Hi everyone, my name is Rachel, I am from Cash App, uh, and together with my colleagues, we own, operate, and maintain our Kubernetes fleet for Cash App services. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about some work we've done over the past year to delve into the multi-cluster ecosystem with our Kubernetes setup. Um, so just to set the ground a little, before multi-cluster, we had about six clusters that we were operating, um, three of these being actual services, so we have a prod, development, and staging cluster, and three maintenance utility clusters. Uh, we had about 5,000 nodes, we had 500 services on these clusters, and um, a pretty high number of cores, RAM, and disk usage. After multi-cluster, we can see that same number of services, double number of clusters, but relatively comparable cores, RAM, and disk usage, and we've actually seen a decrease in node usage thanks to some work we've done around our Carpenter setup. So why would you want to use multi-cluster when you're, you, when you're running Kubernetes uh, cl clusters? Um, the big part is removing a single point of failure and improving platform resiliency. The case study that we have is when you're doing an in-place upgrade or if just a cluster fails and you only have one cluster tied to your environment, you lose that environment until you spin up another cluster or restore your cluster back to normal. Um, so part of this is building into multi-cluster, spreading out multiple clusters per environment so that we can fail over more easily whenever we need it. Um, and so part of this extension into what we're looking at in 2025 and beyond is looking into new operational opportunities to simplify adding more clusters to our environment and making it easier for us to spin them up, tear them down, and migrate services back and forth between them. Uh, the last part is reducing per cluster resource usage. Uh, part of our case study from last year is when we upgraded up uh, our Kubernetes version, we saw that there were just too many API server calls because we had so many services running the same cluster fully scaled up and the API server couldn't keep up with it until we over-provisioned it. However, even if you want to move to multi-cluster, there are some challenges along the way. Uh, first thing you have to consider is resources for services, things like secrets, et cetera, config maps. How do you keep them synced across clusters in the same state to make sure you're serving traffic reliably? How do you make sure that as you're moving services between clusters, that you are making sure that you're doing it in an incremental fashion that lets you roll back easily, send 1% of traffic at a time, and not disrupt any customer flows downstream. The next part is how do you figure out how to operate double the number of clusters or more without doubling your efforts as a compute team or a team that's owning your platform? And so the final part that I want to touch on here in challenges part is making this transparent to service owners without requiring them to learn about Kubernetes. One thing we have at Cash App is a uh, UI that service owners can reach out to when they want to deploy their service, see their deploy history, uh, update auto scaling, resource config, et cetera. And one thing we did when we were moving to multi-cluster was we upgraded this view to now show a pod skew across clusters. So if that you, you as a service owner received an alert that, oh, one of my pods is unhealthy, you can narrow down which pod it was, which cluster it was, when you open up your support ticket to receive assistance on the issue. And so when you're moving the multi-cluster, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and it really depends on your organization for which way it works best for you. The most straightforward approach might be to reach for tiered clusters, where you segment your services based on tiers, whether you have your highly critical tier one services that can't go down at all or disrupts customers' usage. You have your tier three services, which aren't super critical. They could go down for a day and be recovered, and there's probably some SSQ back from backing them that will restore their state. And then you have the majority of services in the middle um, that can maybe go down for an hour or more, and they won't impact things too, too much. The issue with this, though, is that if you have cross-cluster dependencies now, if a highly critical service depends on a tier two service and you lose your tier two cluster, you've just, you've just coupled all your clusters together again and created your, your same problem. So the next thing we looked into is AZ clusters, where we are an AWS shop at Cash App, and so you're looking into per region, per availability zone, spin up a cluster and have replicas of your services in those clusters serving traffic out of them. This is great, this is something we wanna to move towards in the future, but for getting started with multi-cluster, this is a big lift. For every region doing at least three or more clusters, that's just a lot of work to spin up and provision those and migrate across them. So what we settled on for this past year was clone clusters, where we take a one-to-one -one copy of our cluster state, 
provision a new cluster with that state, and migrate services over to them. And the goal with this is, one, so that if we, had, if we can have two clusters running at 100% at any point along the migration path, if things fail, we have a very easy way to go back to our original state without disrupting the business. And the other part is that this gets us into the process of thinking of how do we provision more clusters, how do we think about the processes that go into that, the components that go into that, and how do we make it easier for us as a platform team to continue operating at the scale that we do. And so this is a brief overview of like the core cloud technologies we leverage at Cash App. Um, and because a lot of the way we provision is through things like Terraform wrapped in Terrorunt, and we're using Atlantis to manage those. Um, and so we run on EKS, we manage our node groups with Carpenter, and we do HPA with Keta, so we get custom metrics, and all of these are wrapped into IAC components and modules that we can solidify as a process in a runbook. So any platform engineer can pick up this process, provision a new cluster, and start migrating services into it, which is really good when you're working on a large team and you want things to be reproducible. Um, the next part that's really important when you're starting this process out that we learned was having good coordination like spreadsheets. And so this involves taking a snapshot in time of all the services that you operate in your clusters and sort of breaking them up, tracking which tiers they are, tracking which weird components some services have that others don't that you need to be aware of when you're migrating them, and reaching out to service teams and having their like Slack channel or however you communicate in that sheet. So if something does come up or if you need to communicate that, hey, I'm going to migrate services one, two, and three on this day, you can reach out to those service owner teams and make sure you've sort of acquired the lock on that service for the day so that they're not updating things in the background and disrupting things. Um, the last key component that I'll be touching on more is defining a cluster state. Uh, what we really want to think about here is the life cycle of a cluster. We're not just introducing new clusters, but we want to also pave a path towards the cycling of clusters and the sort of distribution of clusters for different workloads in the future. And so we've defined this in the four main states. The init state is when you have just first set up all of your cluster's components, um, whether that is like your EKS module, whether that is a few initial Argo CD components, things like that. The gateway state is when you're thinking about per service ingresses, when you've started to prepare your cluster to be ready to start migrating services into it. So this may involve things like backfilling, owner and deployer roles, secrets, config maps, things at the cluster level that are getting prepped for per service needs. And then we have this partial state, and this is where our clusters tend to live for most of the time that we're in a migration. Uh, this partial state defines it so that we have some clusters, some services in the cluster that are ready and healthy and receiving traffic as we slowly iterate through our um, wealth of services, uh, but we're not at 100% yet. And so once we finish our migration, whenever we repeat this flow per environment, per cluster, et cetera, then we move to a steady state, we mark it as ready, and so now when you're building out any tooling that needs to help services, service owners provision new services, update their services, they can read against this state and they can make sure that these changes are propagated correctly to the right clusters. Um, instead of getting ahead of yourself, if say you're in a partial state and we service X hasn't been migrated yet, we wanna make sure that changes to that don't suddenly cause it to become active in a cluster where not all the resources for it are present yet. And so after you've sort of figured out the process, you've thought through your architecture, you've thought through how you provision new clusters, now you need to get your migration tooling right. Um, and so some of the things that worked really well for us was batch scripts. Uh, at Cash App, we have an internal tool that just like the UI has a CLI offering that does a lot of the same things. Um, and so for us, it was really straightforward for us to write some Go and bash scripts to wrap that up and make sure that we could do this efficiently for a number of services instead of going through one by one on a suite of 500 of them. Um, and the next part, like I just mentioned, with these cluster states, we want to track these in a global cluster topology file. And so we've defined this sort of YAML object uh, that we sync in the S3 that can be read by all of our other tooling to tell us at any given point what are all the clusters that live in a single environment. And within those clusters in the environment, um, how are they? Like, like, what is their current state? Are they steady? Are they partial? How much traffic should they be receiving compared to other clusters in the environment? Um, and it's just a really nice way to track that state. The next part is our original clusters were set up to have namespace scoped resources, and so you had service A, and service A's config maps, secrets, all of that other stuff would be in the same namespace. And so this made it really easy when we were wrapping queue commands 
because uh, you could sort of just pass in a list of service names and know that that would also correspond to the namespace you wanted when you were running kubectl, get this resource, and apply it to another cluster. The other part is updating your observability tools. We use Datadog a lot, but a lot of this was making sure that any like saved views we had for deployment health, traffic health, et cetera, were updated ahead of time to account for these new clusters so that as we're in the migration process, we're not having to consider that. We can just turn on new views and make sure that as new services enter the new cluster, they're coming up healthily. We see any error logs, metrics, et cetera. And the final part, uh, which sort of tackles the challenge of how do you keep secrets in sync across the cluster, was for us to move away from our old AWS CSI secrets driver into external secrets operator, which was really nice for us. It made things really simple to have secrets moved out of just being directly volume mounted by the operator and just having everything be in uh, namespace scoped in secrets manager for us to do a grep over everything and then also have all of our tooling write to and update and read from a single store. And so like I mentioned earlier, we do Istio stuff. Uh, we want to be able to move our services over incrementally. We want to be able to take critical service A, turn it to 1% in a new cluster, and make sure that any errors or any requests that are coming in are in the exact sort of expected pattern as we would see in the legacy cluster to make sure we're not introducing any new regressions as we move services over. Um, and so. Part of this is to really the magic of the virtual service, where we can take all of our clusters, both east and west, and represent them as hosts and routes in our virtual service resource on a per service basis. And so basically, this is just tracking to make sure that for a given service, it should receive 100% of the traffic. But as you're going through this flow, you can distribute that 100% through these different routes, and that's giving you your cross cluster load balancing, if you were. So at the end of the state, um, You'll see that like, for all the services that are coming into that local cluster, this is taken from one of the new clusters um, that that is now receiving 100% of the traffic that's coming in from an, uh, a caller higher up in the stack. And so this really simplifies how we move traffic back and forth. And along with that, Istio is really great for telemetry. Uh, this dashboard at the top is just a fraction of the metrics we get from Istio and how we're able to track the health of a service in the, in the traffic sense as we move them over of seeing all of the inbound errors, all of the outbound errors, and thinking through questions that we might get from a service owner as we're midway through the migration of, oh, I see that my service has been moved, but why is it not a 50-50% split? We can see that in the inbound traffic that there are just some callers further upstream that only exist in the legacy cluster still because we're still migrating. So you won't see that 50-50% split until we finish moving everything and the full call path down can stay within either the new cluster or the old cluster. And a little bit more breakdown on our tiers. Um, I think this is just a really cool way to set yourself up for success when you're thinking about any large scale migrations you want to do as an organization. It's really segmenting services into tiers and not telling people what tiers they should be, but giving them a guideline so that they can self-elect what tier their services belong into based on some set criteria. So some of the big key uh, factors in this for us are the impacts of SEVs on the business. Uh, how badly does it crash everything else if service A goes down? And the numbers of, of nines of availability that a service must adhere to to serve its use case. Um, so as you have ser service owners do this, you'll tend to see a pretty even bell curve, description, bell curve distribution where your highly critical services are gonna be like, yes, absolutely, we are tier zero services. You have services that are like, hey, we could go down for a week. We don't really care, we're background workers, jobs, et cetera. We can go into tier three. And then your defaults are gonna be a lot of tier twos and tier ones as people who are kind of like nebulous in that space and could use some further distinction, but also, this gives you a lot of padding in your migration work as well, because you can start with your tier three services that you know aren't going to be critical, aren't going to be breaking anything if a migration for a single service goes wrong, and you can use this as your, as your test bed in each environment to move them over the line. And this guides you all the way up so that by the time you're touching these tier zero services that we know are highly critical, you've refined your pattern, you know the process, you know the success path. And so now we get into the actual migration. And on the right here, I have this diagram that really illustrates the life cycle of a cluster at Cache App now, where we're gonna provision a new cluster, we're gonna backfill all those resources, we're gonna make sure that we can scale the deployment first, no traffic, just make sure it's healthy, all of the resources it needs to run are present, we're not getting in event errors, and then we actually think about the traffic part. And so part of this 
to make this part easy, both at the service scaling level and also the traffic level, is thinking about guardrails. How can we automate our clusters to do the work for us so that we don't have to do the heavy lifting on every service? Three things that we found really helpful on this front are Keta, and Keta is just an ex really an enhanced version of HPA where we can go in and just based off an annotation on a namespace object, say that when you backfill a service for the first time, set its replicas to zero until we manually say that we want to scale that individual service up and test to see if it's ready or not. The next part is Cooper Healthy. Cooper Healthy allows you to define checks within your uh, cluster and within your infrastructure to define an expected state. And so one thing we used this here for was the traffic portion of our migration, where we had a Kuber Healthy job continually pinging all of the services in the cluster. And so we could go into Datadog and sort of evaluate that state, whether it's healthy or not, to know if it's ready to start receiving real traffic and we're ready to start shifting that over. And the last one's Caverno. Um, Caverno is just a policy engine, similar to Gatekeeper, where you define sort of guardrails in your system based on policies, and they prohibit actions being taken in the cluster that you don't want people to take. Um, and then, of course, we test them with Chainsaw in the back. And then the big part around this zero downtime and making sure that we are true to that is making sure that we are set up for success on our observability side. And so this is making sure you have notebooks, dashboards, et cetera, to track deployment errors, route health, request rates, and any other tertiary error sites, error metrics that you would want to be associated with any of those to make sure that when you're migrating services over in batches, you have a full snapshot view of that entire batch of services, that they moved over healthily, that services, that traffic is being sent in, and you're not just depending on cube logs to be the only source of truth here. And so even though we addressed a lot of the challenges we saw from the get-go, there were definitely still pain points in our journey. Uh, the first one being backfill inconsistencies. Um, our backfill tooling works pretty great for about 90% of the time, but there are, are occasional instances where you might have a secret placeholder that doesn't get moved or an AWS secret that doesn't get replicated correctly. So it's really just understanding what to do in those situations, documenting on the process so that as different people pick up this migration work, they can go touch on a run book, touch on an FAQ, and know which secondary script we have in place to manually fix that. Um, and then the next part is just making sure you're keeping track of the cluster scope. And it's really tool schools of thought that I've had throughout this process where services will continue to be created after you've started your migration. People will continue to modify their services. People will continue to provision new ones. And even though you created a snapshot at the start of your migration, by the time you've ended, there might be another 75, plus, 75 services that you had no idea existed until that point in time. And so you could take two schools of thought, one being, as new services come up, we're gonna have something that updates our snapshot and continues to increase the scope and drag out this migration, but at least we're getting everything along the way. Or just do a check-in once you're finished, once you've completed the initial scope of your migration, and then take count of any new services that come up and just add them to the bottom and just know that you're gonna do some cleanup work to get those over the line as well. And then make sure, because basically, when we think about cluster state, like I said earlier, once we've reached that steady state, at that point, any new created services go fully, full, fully to both clusters evenly. And so you're worried about that middle state where any new services that were created during the partial state that didn't get that treatment. And then finally, the weird services. Not every service is perfect. Not every service migrates correctly or easily. Uh, and so part of our workflow was just getting through the easy services. And if a service gave us an issue that was gonna take us longer than like half an hour to an hour to de debug, mark it on the spreadsheet, track it for later, and work with the service owners more closely to make sure we're rectifying things without breaking them. Money, by the way. Um, so what I mentioned earlier is that to keep this fallback state easy for us to move services back and forth between clusters if something goes wrong, um, is that we kept both clusters in this setup scaled to 100 until we reached the end of the migration. Uh, this made it really easy for us. If there was ever an incident or an outage, we could just update the virtual service to point back to the old cluster, and we would have been fine within minutes. Um, and so one, thing we, one really cool thing we found out was that afterwards, after we completed the migration work, we were working through the scale down of basically being like, if all of these services in both clusters are now receiving 50% of the traffic they did before, they probably only need around 50% of the replicas that they did in one cluster to run as expected. And so that's where we see the thing on the first slide where same number of services, um, same number of, double number of clusters, less nodes, and 
comparable resource usage. So we didn't actually see a huge jump up in cost after finishing the full migration. Um, and so these are just things that you have to consider. It worked really well for us, but depending on your business needs, depending on your organization needs, if that is something that is worth it to you to be like, yep, we're gonna keep it scaled at 100 until we finish, and then we're gonna do some cleanup work versus cleaning up along the way. And so part of that scaled on process was making another batch tool, using some more Go. Um, and it's really going in and ta tackling two cases. Not all services leverage auto-scaling for whatever purposes. Maybe the auto-scaler doesn't bring up new pods as it needs to to serve the needs of the service or something else. And so what we did was we had to first fetch that auto-scaling type, whether it was Keta, whether it was a rare legacy HPA configuration, or whether it did, didn't have any auto-scaling whatsoever, and treat them accordingly. Uh, a couple of the other things that we did was we operate in approximately three availability zones. We provision our node groups into those availability zones. And so for services that maybe only had three, replica, three, three pods before, we wanted to make sure we set that as the floor for both clusters so that if any availability zone experienced an outage, a new node group in, the, in a nearby availability zone could pick up that workload and continue scaling the service forward. Um, and then other things that I mentioned in the open source community, my team has done a lot of really great work around upgrading our Carpenter usage and getting our node compaction set up so we can see that big decrease in nodes. And also, we are starting to explore leveraging VPA for some of our heavier services, um, more around like the Kafka space where you have a big burst of messages and you need to scale down. And you don't necessarily want to do that for all of the topics that your team may manage. And so we've seen a lot of success there uh, in terms of just cost and ease of usage with implementing VPA. Um, so now I want to take a step back. We've gone through the migration process. It all worked. It was zero downtime. It was great. Uh, and I want to talk about more about how we as platform engineers might view this process a little differently from product engineers and how we need to think about the process to sort of shield them and give them their happy path while we proceed on ours. And so the sort of big distinguishers here is for platform engineers, when we think about going to multi-cluster, when we think about doing a large-scale migration about this, we're worried about things like cost spend, uh, we're worried about things like how can we scale up our platform but also still keep it maintainable for the same number of team members that we have right now and the same level of effort we're putting in to our clusters today, and how can we take a look at anything that deviates from that and look into automations, simplifications of process to make it easier on ourselves as we continue to grow and scale. Product engineers on the other side, they don't want to hear about Kubernetes most of the time. They want an abstraction layer that is invisible to them. They want to, be, they want to have the ability to focus on delivering uh, changes and updates to business logic, features, et cetera, and they want a really simple deploy path. And so for many uh, service owners at Cash App, they knew we were doing migration work. We communicated with them we were going to make a change for their service. But at the end of the day, all they really see is that, cool, now I have the same number of pods, but in my deploy UI, I just see that they're spread across two different clusters now, and that's fine. And so this is how we sort of kept that product story simple. It really just communicate one time at the beginning, set up a Slack channel, set up an FAQ doc, give service owners the space to ask their questions and get their confusion out of the way to make the rest of the process really simple and keep them in, like don't keep them in the dark, because if an alert goes off and an incident goes off, and it was because you were moving something, you didn't tell them, they will not be happy about that. Um, and the power of batch tooling, the reason that we were able to execute on this with just a handful of engineers is because we were able to write these batch wrappers around our existing automation tooling and abstraction tooling to make this a really seamless process. Uh, and like I just said, FAQ and project channel. And the last one it goes without saying, but don't cause an incident. Do things safely, do things slowly. If you're uncertain about something, um, like say traffic shifting, if you don't want to just YOLO it and go to 100%, start off at 1%, watch the metrics for 20 minutes or so, make sure that this is stable before ramping up the rest of the services load. And improving the platform story, this is where I'm going to talk about a lot of the future facing things that we want to do in 2025 and beyond at Cash App to help make this easier for us. Uh, the first one, first couple of being actually infra pipelines and infra backup, uh, infra pipelines being if we're going to be provisioning a lot of new clusters, especially as we move towards AZ clusters or towards workload specific clusters, we need to make sure there's a way to do environment promotion of uh, ISC resources and that there is a reproducible path of saying that, hey, if we want to upgrade this component in one cluster, it should probably be propagated across all the clusters in some automated fashion. And we're looking at the pipeline solutions to help us with this. 
The other is infra backup. Uh, this has been the big year of GitOps um, when we have several members of our team contributing heavily to getting GitOps off the ground at Cash App and making sure that we have a way, if needed, to fully restore our ecosystem uh, using Argo app manifest, et cetera, from a Git repo. And it's been really great. Um, the next part is just kind of ties in the pipelines, but time to new cluster, time to new cluster right now. In the span of days, what if we got it into the span of hours? Uh, that would be just really amazing for our reliability story and our operational story. Uh, GitOps, like I just mentioned, and the prevalence of game days. Um, I have a whole slide dedicated to this, but this is really just how do you as a platform team secure some dedicated time to go crash your system and know that when you crash your system, you know how it's going to recover or what gaps you have that you need to automate and build out to make sure that it recovers safely. And so we're going to dive into cluster operations a little bit. So a lot of this is around automating and streamlining that cluster zero to one, making sure that we know our process today, but we also know the parts where it lags a little bit, parts that we could maybe compact together, parts that we could streamline. And so one thing I've been looking into with one of my colleagues is exploring cross-plane compositions as a way to create multi-stage uh, cluster provisioning steps so that you're, you as a platform engineer aren't following a runbook with 15 steps and manually doing each one of them, submitting your PRs, getting your approvals, but you can have this composition take care of that for you, simplify the number of reviews you need to get this over the line, and we're hopeful that this is going to bring some improvements. Um, the next part is some batch cluster tasks, and this is, this is things like um, making sure your service gets deployed to all the clusters, making sure that if you're doing an upgrade to a component, those get propagated out without you having to sort of manually sit by it as soon as you've uh, affirmed and asserted that this is healthily it's working in one of your other clusters, in your blue-greening sort of. Um, and so in on the tooling side, we're looking into extending our CLI capabilities to be more multi-cluster. We're looking into improving our update cadence process, and we're looking into how we can sync additional resources like we do with ESO for secrets. Um, in terms of practice, really heavy on the Argo CD GitOps side, and then really looking forward to exploring IEC pipelines more in that same vein to help us move faster. Um, in the last part, like I mentioned with guardrails before, we want to continue expanding in this space. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with Caverno and Chainsaw now. We, we anticipate this growth, this usage to grow uh, over the next year. And then also on the Kuber Healthy side, as we get more people up and running and understanding what this tooling can offer them, both on our compute team, but maybe other things like observability, traffic, CSED, that they are implementing more checks so that at some point, 90% of your cluster, like you have the expected state of what a new cluster should look like, and you can fall back on these policies, fall back on these checks to assert that that's what you are tracking against. And then for game days, the big tool that we've been using is AWS Fault Injection Simulator, or FIS. Um, very similar concepts to something like Chaos Monkey, where it gives you the ability to target outages in your infrastructure um, or your services. And so we just run regular game days. I think we've run like two or three now at this point. Um, but it's just coordinated efforts where support engineers from all different abstractions of our platform get together. We run the FIS tool for maybe five, 10 minutes to just crash something. And we observe. We wait for things to come back up. We identify bottle gaps where, oh, this database didn't come back up. What do we need to do to make sure that next time we run this game day, that does come up correctly? Um, and we really want to extend this to cover additional things. Um, how can we track to make sure that all of our deployer role components come up? How do we make sure that any services that come up, that if we want to do the GitOps restor restoration path, that they are actually serving traffic as soon as they spin up in Argo and they sync correctly? Um, and it's just really looking into what is the manual effort we have to do to run these game days versus what can we automate? How can we get this down to a few button presses to get this whole process end to end and be more confident as a platform team that we are serving our users at the company? And that's all I had. So I'm really happy for a QA. and a If anyone has any questions, uh, this is my dog, Hera. And thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, can you bring some clarity on how you switch network? Because you specify you have cluster A and cluster B. You have virtual service in cluster A. You put the weights and start shifting traffic gradually to cluster B. But eventually, you want to destroy cluster A, or not. Or virtual service still exists there, and entry point is still in one cluster, and you're just making a mesh, uh, sorry, 
two meshes connected. Correct. So each service will have its own ingress gateway in each cluster. And so when we do that virtual service update, um, we're thinking in like a times two capacity for two clusters, where if we set it to be at 50% in one cluster, that's 100% share for the new cluster and 100% share for the old cluster, but you're like, or rather like that's 100% in cluster calls and you split that out 50-50. So our legacy services do still exist in this context and they're just sharing that load, if that answers your question. Which means that network still goes to cluster A first and, and a sentry point before shitting the traffic. So we split it up higher up and they get load balanced across oh, the Oh, you have clusters. a global load balancer on top of them. Yep. Thanks for clarifying. Of course, thank you. Hey, thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm curious about how you handle multi-tenancy and then multi-environments for your different tenants in this uh, setup you have. So we, I don't believe I've explored into that space too much. Uh, what we have right now is for our three primary environments that services deploy into, they're separate AWS accounts that are isolated from each other. And so we have this set up so that these two clusters now are both deploy targets within the same AWS account for say like staging or production and the services go to play out and that's how we get our segmentation. But that is something we'll probably be looking into in the next year. Thanks for the um, presentation. My question was around kind of the actual setup of your clusters. I saw you said, saw like you had a lot of bash scripts. So there's, you don't actually have anything like in Terraform or infrastructure as code for your cluster, or are you more like just running CLIs that actually do all these things? It's a bit of both. For the actual cluster setup, it's primarily Terraform modules wrapped in like a Terraform wrapper. Um, and so you'll have your like EKS model uh, deployed onto Argo as an application. You'll set up like your Argo CD uh, UI and everything and your certificates. Um, but the majority of our cluster setup is IAC. It's the actual migration part where we start wrapping these uh, kubectl scripts. OK, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And if there is, oh, yes. Uh, if uh, while you are migrating from cluster A to cluster B, and uh, let's say one of the services not acting upright during the migration on the targeted cluster, however, that service is using some underlying downstream services as well. So first question would be that, do you first migrate the service based on the dependency tree? Or if not, if the each and every service are independent in the case of microservices, how do you manage that? So we actually uh, broke this up a little bit. We, we separated the traffic from the deployment part. So all of these traffic resources are still present in the new cluster when we do our backfill, but they're pointing back at the legacy cluster. So even if you take a random service and you deploy it out in your new cluster, you scale it up, you start sending traffic to it, the dependencies, because those virtual services are configured, they're still reaching back into the old cluster. You do incur a tiny bit of latency, like one millisecond bump from the cross-cluster jump, um, but that's just something we accepted as we moved throughout this process and just make sure we time box the actual migration to get through it as efficiently as possible. Um, but yeah, like in, in dependency wise, the only real thing we saw was uh, like things like roles um, or secrets that other like worker jobs in a higher tier are depending on, but we would see those within the um, logs of the service and event errors as we scaled it up and noticed that, oh, hey, we actually do need to go do a backfill on that service to make sure at least the resources are there even if we haven't scaled it up yet. Okay, so are there any validation at what point you decide that, okay, I'm ready to move on to a new cluster because until it is not completely validated, uh, at one point you will be running a double the uh, compute resources until it is fully complete, correct? I, I didn't hear the last part of that. Uh, I meant to say that if, let's say, the service you are migrating, and if there is an issue with that, at one point you have to run cluster A and cluster B at the same time in this kind of model. That means double we the compute resource. Our, we fall back on our observability a lot, whether it's monitors and alarms to alert us if things go wrong. Right. Um, this wasn't something that we faced during this migration, but that would have caught us if it did come up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm going to hang out here a bit if anyone wants to come chat, uh, but thank you.